amigos, amigas, bienvenidos a Lima, Perú. Welcome to Lima, Perú, my home, my city, the place I love the most in the world. And today, continuing with my experimental series from home dedicated to the best museums in Peru, we are going to continue with the uh, description of the circuit inside the Franciscan Museum, the church and monastery of the Franciscan Order of Lima. So before we start, we have about a minute uh, to, face, to first say hi to all people joining. Hola, amigos. Hello, hello. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for visiting. Hi, Dori. Hi, Adrian, Lorraine, Marilyn, David and Wendy. Hello, thanks for coming. Hello, hello. Berha, hello, amigo. Hola, hola. Sayuri, thanks for coming, amiga. Gracias, gracias. You just finished a tour, right? I, I was not able to join earlier your tour, but thanks a lot for coming to, to this series, my friend. This is a series about museums uh, in Peru, and uh, this is a little bit like an experiment, as I said before, because I am going to be using documentaries, Peruvian documentaries, so you'll see how Peruvian documentaries are, uh, but of course the original language is in uh, Spanish. So uh, I will mute the, the videos, of course at the end I will tell you how you can access to the original um, video and, and see it because I'm, I'm using this from YouTube. Uh, giving the the credit, of course, to the um, to the uh, let's say uh, television channel that is making these videos, and uh, we're going to use also the the documentaries, uh, not just to this place, the Franciscan Monastery, also to many other museums, um, to to get to know how they are inside. Hi, John. Hello. Mwah. Thanks for coming. Another colleague. Hola, John. Hi, Jane. Oh, Lorraine. Muchas gracias. Thanks for your support. Thank you so much for, for your support. As you know, these are, um, let's say, pay as you wish um, tours. Uh, they are just tip supported. So any any support um, is really a blessing for, for all tour guides and also for Hago, uh, this, this uh, community that we love so much. No? So in this way, we can support the website for this website to continue existing. So um, today, well, as you know, I, I am here in my house in, in Lima, Peru. Uh, please feel comfortable. We're going to start with the description. This is the second part of the uh, of the tour inside the Monastery of the Franciscans. I do this tour like almost three times a week when I am uh, leading uh, tour groups in person in Lima. This is probably the museum I visit the most since... 15 years ago when I started to be a tour guide here, an official tour guide in, in Lima. So um, unfortunately, well, let me tell you a little bit of how this series uh, of um, uh, they say from home events using documentaries started. So um, I've been knocking lots of doors for about almost two years um, asking permits to get into museums. And um, not all museums are ready for something like this. I mean, like getting inside with, with a gimbal and cell phone inside a museum is not really easy, especially for the owners of museums that are quite like traditional old places. So um, after, um, well, trying for, for long uh, and realizing it will not be possible, I wanted to, to still give you the feeling of how... maybe also in some other parts of my country. Uh, but this is not uh, to, to be uh, like, the idea is not to burn the experience. Uh, uh, it's not to replace the experience. It's just to give you a sensation of how it is to visit the best museums of Peru. Uh, well, in, in this occasion, uh, guided by, by me. So, well, if you have questions, my friends, please share them. Um, I, will, I will be now checking all your commentaries, all your questions. I am a professional licensed tour guide in Lima, Peru. Uh, guiding is my passion, is my love, and that's why I want to also do it 
uh, in, in this format, uh, uh, trying to become, uh, in a way, a um, sort of like representative of, of the city and ambassador of Lima. So, well, now I think we are all together. Uh, and now uh, I think uh, the group is here. So we're going to start with this event. And first, uh, let me turn the camera. And I will give, of course, credit to the, um, to the channel that is uh, providing this documentary. So the channel that you will see is in uh, YouTube. The name of this channel is TV Peru. Right. So TV Peru is actually the channel number seven of Peruvian television. It, it really doesn't go everywhere around the world. But thanks to YouTube, they are able to allow people from the world to get to know the material they have produced, cultural material they have produced uh, for the world. The only little difficulty is the fact that all of these documentaries are in Spanish, okay? They dedicate most of the documentaries to museums and sites, historic sites in Peru. So today we are going to visit, for the second occasion, the convent of the Franciscans in Lima. I will be giving now a play to this uh, video and um, I want to give you the sensation of coming inside this fabulous museum. So um, in the part one of this, um, they say this event that I started last week, we were able to, vis to visit different parts of the museum. We were able to see the beautiful library, for example, of the uh, monastery, the patio of the house. Uh, we're seeing some footage, some images of what we saw in the part one, the first floor of the house, the church of the Franciscans with this Moorish uh, air. Uh, uh, we were able to see also uh, the choir room, uh, many beautiful parts of the house, but we haven't finished, of course. The house is big. The circuit in this museum takes me at least one full hour, and that's just hitting the highlights. So if you come to Lima and you visit this monastery, which has to be in the top five sites you have to see in Lima, well, you will have to come to visit this place for sure. So we are just going to start a little bit with um, the next section of the museum. I'm going to put a stop first. So as I said before, we have check some sections of the museum that are part of the circuit. But before we go further, I want to tell you a couple of things. The Monastery of the Franciscans is still a house for Franciscans. It is not just a museum. We have about 20 Franciscans living in the monastery that we are going to see, right? Uh, I have a question here. David and Wendy, is the museum in the city itself? Yes, yes, of course, David and Wendy. Uh, and in a moment, I will be also sharing with you some images of where the museum is. If we wait until the end, I will tell you where, which one is the website, all the information uh, that will help you to become also ambassadors of the museums we have in Peru. So um, the first section we are going to visit is this one that is called the Sala Profundis. So the Sala Profundis is, is very special because in the colonial times when the house was an active monastery that have about 300 Franciscan friars. Also, oh, it was a, a place that had, was full of life, full of people. In this room called the Sala Profundis or the Profundis Hall is where when someone passed away, uh, there were uh, celebrated some funerary, let's say, uh, uh, let's say events, uh, like uh, uh, traditions. But now this uh, section offers a beautiful series of paintings that belongs to the Franciscans. This is the series of the Passion of Jesus, uh, Passion de Cristo, uh, the Passion of Jesus Christ in these big paintings, uh, canvases that are up to two meters tall. They are very, very huge. It's a complete series. Is attributed uh, to a, a, one of the uh, most famous European artists, uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Also, uh, imagine the wealth the house must have had uh, to be able to own 
paintings of this size from Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, but here we have uh, these Christs that uh, are also some of the uh, about 10 that the house owns. Oh, yes, it is, it's really amazing. Just imagine the wealth no, in the house in every corner. This is just one room. Uh, these Christs were made uh, in the um, this material that is called marfil, which is the horn of the elephant, and were carved in the Philippines. Mm? So uh, this is the type of uh, wealth we have in a house like this one. And at the end, look at this element that is decorating the final part of the room. Of course, originally it was not here. What you're seeing here is a colonial balcony a wooden balcony which the legend, the tradition says it used to be inside the house of the Viceroys that is not far away from here or from this location where we are in this moment and it used to be in the chapel of the uh, house of the Viceroy. Yes, thank you, Jane. Ivory. <laughs> so I, I forgot about the name in English. Sometimes it happens to me. Too many names in my head. So yes, it's ivory, the material of the Christ. So thank you, thank you, Jane. So uh, as you can see, in the center of this room, there is a, a little access downwards because that is the section uh, that takes you into a private burial place, a burial site where the uh, most important Franciscans and also the benefactors of the order were buried. So why would you like to be buried in a place like this one? Of course, the reasons are many, but the most important one definitely is the general belief in the colonial times that if you were buried in a church, you were closer to God, right? So that was the intention. So now I will go uh, to explain a little bit of where we are in uh, Lima when we're talking about the convent of the Franciscans, now that I have your attention. So first of all, this is an air picture of part of the house, which is really now part, it is not the totality that the Franciscans owned originally. The Franciscans owned a large, large territory that consisted originally in seven cloisters. What's a cloister? This element you see square, that's a cloister. They used to be seven in total. And something also important is that, can you see this avenue, amigos? Can you see this avenue? This avenue was built in the 40s, in the 1940s, and it was made to allowed more traffic into the city and permit a more, let's say, a, a, a fluid circulation of cars. So uh, unfortunately, this in a way ruined as well the, uh, the original layout within the monastery. So I want to give you now, I will take advantage of the Zoom um, that we have here incorporated. So this is a map of Lima from the end of the 17th century, right? So Lima, look, look at this detail. We have a wall around. Can you see that, my friends? There is a wall. The walls in cities like Lima, for example, in all the territories, the Hispanic territories of the Americas, uh, were created to defend the cities from pirates, uh, from uh, corsarios or privateers, uh, and Lima in particular was so wealthy, so rich, that it was necessary to protect it very, very much. So because within the cities, like Lima, for example, there used to be churches, and the churches had lots of wealth, gold and silver. So now I will zoom a little bit so I can give you an idea of where is the Church of the Franciscans, the one we are seeing in the documentary. So this site you see over here is the main square of Lima. Lima's main square, Cathedral of Lima, I will use the, the point over here. So Lima's main square, Cathedral of Lima, the Palace of the Viceroys, nowadays the house of the President of Peru, and this big complex you see here, 
all of this huge complex you see here is the property of the Franciscans. Uh, in Spanish, the monastery was the uh, Monasterio de San Francisco de Jesús el Grande. So the monastery of the San Francis of Jesus the Great. And it was called the Great because it was the biggest monastery in the entire country back then. So what happened with this part of the house? Nowadays, we just keep this section over here. The avenue, oh sorry, the avenue that now is over here has cut into the territory of the order. Now we have a private section uh, uh, that belongs to the Franciscans in the part that used to be the orchard. Also, I have another picture over here. I hope you can also find it interesting. Let me uh, also go backwards a little bit and move upwards the camera. So here you can see the nowadays uh, La Ute of downtown Lima. This is the main square, Plaza Mayor. This is the house of the president of Peru. This is the church of the Franciscans. And look at this. This section over here used to be part of the monastery now is cut in two by an avenue. There is also another interesting thing I want to share with you. Look at this. Uh, this image uh, corresponds to one of the sides of one of the limits of the house. And I will try to move a little bit my uh, the camera over here. So this is one of the walls of the house of the Francisca. This is the section that most visitors don't get to see. But when I have my two groups, I always take them to this part. So they see this wall here and you can see the arches. Can you see the arches here? This used to be, there used to be the original limit of the house, which even is described over here. Let me do again a little zoom over here, right? So. You can see here these arches in this section over here. Can you see the little arches? So these arches here still exist in this section, right? So let me now de-zoom now that you know already which, which place is this one. And what is amazing, my friends, is although... Although you can see here, like the arches are being a little bit covered over here. The avenue cutting in two is in this section. Over here, you can see that continuation of the wall. Can you see the This section here has a little arch. I don't know if we are able to see the arch from here, but there is this wall is part of the original construction, which is here in this part and this used to be also the monastery okay so this is just to give you an idea how huge the house used to be okay so we're going back to the video and i hope i was able to answer the question about where this uh place is because um i think it's necessary for all of us to know uh, about the location no, between this site and uh, also the other important places of Lima, such as the main square of the city. So I have here, I think, a question from my friend Sayuri. Let me, before we go to continue with the uh, circuit, are they also owner of properties besides the monastery? Yes, Sayuri. In Bahia, they have many properties in that. Yes, 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 of course. That is pretty much a side um entry of money for the order because the order is no longer as you know as big in numbers of people so uh, usually the religious orders uh, they used to sustain themselves from the um, money the benefactors used to give away to them and also um, something that was like a dowry that you would give uh, uh, like to your spouse to your husband to your wife when you got married. So uh, because you were not getting married to someone uh, else, you were sort of like getting married with the order, you were giving away all of that money to the order. So that was in a way uh, how these religious orders um, used to be able to grow. But also the Franciscans were in such big emotional despair, like a sadness and worry, because um, there was a time in which the house was so so beautiful that um, they believed they were going against 
all the, the values of uh, Francis of Assisi and, and, and how Francis of Assisi built the order because he built it based on poverty and the house was too big and too huge. By the way, a, a little parenthesis, this is a, a, a picture of how the house ended up after the earthquake of the year 1940. We had lots of earthquakes uh, that had been the reason of the tremendous transformations of the city of Lima over our history, right? So, um, but well, not all of the uh, house is open to the public, as you know. There are sections that are more private and probably even more beautiful inside, but the section we are seeing here, uh, the church, the uh, entrance to the cloister, the first cloister, all of these cloister right and the underground catacombs are the parts that are visitable this is the only section that we can visit nowadays all the rest is private and is still even across the avenue and it still is of course in the hands of the order right so this is an air view of the main cloister of the house, also called the Claustro de San Francisco, because it was dedicated to Francis of Assisi. And sometimes we get to see the Franciscans. Do the monks live in the other section? Yes, Jane. The monks live on the other section, and sometimes they even go across uh, to the museum section. Uh, for example, the gentleman you saw in part of the video dressed up uh, in the in the clothes of Franciscan, he is the principal of the of the museum, the director of the museum, and he, I I know him. I, I've seen him many times. He's very friendly, but unfortunately, the order in this moment has more elderly monks that cannot be exposed uh, to, let's say, visitors coming in and out because of their fragile condition, health condition, and also because of, well, you know, uh, COVID. COVID can be really bad for them. So they have sort of like enclosed themselves even more than the, they used to, right? So this section over here, uh, it is called the Hall of the Popes. Oh, and the Hall of the Popes is right after the uh, Sala Profundis, uh, the one where we saw the series of Surbaram. All of these seven portraits of popes uh, are connected to the Franciscans. Uh, two of them were uh, sort of like uh, the popes who permitted the creation of uh, the order of the Clarissas or the female order of the Franciscans, the St. Clair order. And also the other one was a person who uh, sort of like uh, organized uh, in a way the order, right? Uh, and the other five popes were Franciscan popes, right? So that's why in this little hole we have these uh, reminders also of the authority of the Franciscans also in the Vatican, right? And after this section, we are going to see another important room, which is the only one who is still is in use, although it is part of the museum, but every once in a while, we get to see it closed uh, and with a big table, uh, like served with food, because this is the refectorio or the refectory. So the refectory, uh, it was the dining room. Uh, it was in use until the 70s. Most of the house continued in use until the 70s because there were uh, also very old-fashioned Franciscans who were not happy uh, to make this place a museum. So what they, uh, they, they opposed and, and they couldn't, the rest of the Franciscans couldn't force them to accept the, uh, to turn the house into a museum. So until all of them agreed, uh, uh, the house continued being, you know, a regular house for them. So in this um, refectory, we have a series of 12 paintings attributed to a female painter, uh, a local female painter, uh, and they are all about uh, the 12 tribes of Israel, las doce tribus de Israel in Spanish. And they are copies 
of a, a series that is in England, so far I know, uh, and uh, it was made by Francisco de Sur Varan, one of the greatest Spanish artists of the 17th century. Uh, it was very common in the old days to copy art, uh, uh, like made in Europe, uh, here in, in Lima, in the Americas. Uh, there was not really much room originally to creativity, but later we found our own voice. And you'll see in the next painting uh, that we were able to uh, create very, very unique pieces. And I think the highlight of the refectory is the painting you are about to see in this moment. You're seeing in this moment. This painting is... I don't know if you can recognize it. Can you recognize it? Can anyone say the name of this painting, my friends? Please, in the comment section. I think it's probably the most, um, let's say, replicated uh, re image, oh, uh, I think, in, in, in Christianity. Uh, muy bien, amigos. Excellent. Yes, Bernhard, David, and Wendy, Ave. Exactly. The Last Supper. In Spanish, muy bien, Dori. Uh, La Ultima Cena, right? The Last Supper. So the Last Supper, uh, I think the most famous, right, Stephanie, exactly. Uh, the most famous Last Supper, I think, is the one of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Is that right? There is even a movie, uh, the Da Vinci Code, about this famous painting. And you're going to see also some very curious elements in this painting. By the way, remember that painting in the colonial times, especially in the context of Peru in the colonial period, uh, paintings were used in a didactic way to teach indigenous about the new faith. It was necessary you know, to sometimes use a so didactic, uh, let's say, language for the eyes that the paintings were at the end sermons to the eyes, right? You should understand the totality of the message without words, right? So we can see here a couple of details which are very curious. We have a round table, right? Yes, we had a round table, exactly, no? So um, the, the round table is, uh, is used a lot in the motives, in this motive of the Last Supper in Peru. Uh, but it's not the only element that is uh, curious, that is unusual. Uh, besides that, you can see that the apostles uh, are all seated on one side as the Romans did, right? You can see that there are children serving the table, right? Children. What is the representation of the children uh, serving the table? So they, that represents uh, uh, the uh, innocence, uh, the innocence of the ones that are serving, right? We even have a little doggy. I don't know if uh, you can get to see the doggy. I think you will able in here. This is a little doggy, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, no, the, the, uh, the idea of the dog, no, uh, being, you know, the obedience also. We have Jesus over here, and we have a table served with Peruvian products. We have lots of Peruvian products. Uh, we're going to play, to put play because I want to tell you more things. I think we're going to get some zooms at some moments on things I want to mention. Um, so the central plate in the, um, in the scene, I think we're going to make a stop. Oh. Oh, this is this is very curious. So the central plate, uh, which we're going to be talking about in a moment, uh, is one of the highlights of the painting. But here, another highlight is this one. The uh, person that you see here, of course, can you deduce who is this person? Uh, I think you can, right? <laughs> it is not difficult to get uh, who is this apostle of Jesus. Uh, we are seeing here, Judas Iscariote, right? And Judas is being uh, sort of like whispered in his ear by the devil, right? So remember, the indigenous were uh, needing to, uh, to understand things very easily, right? And this art was used with that intention. Also, another thing I would like to mention over here is the fact that we have a very delicate female figure over here, right? So who is this person 
Many people ask me every time we come to this room uh, about the book of Dan Brown, uh, the Da Vinci Code, and the possibility if this was Mary Magdalene. Well, um, unfortunately, no, my friends, although, well, I don't know what happened in the mind of the artist, uh, uh, Diego de la Puente, he was a Jesuit, maybe yes, maybe no, but uh, the uh, representation we see here is exactly John, St. John, St. John the Young, St. John the Beloved also, he was the youngest apostle of Jesus. It's estimated that he was about 16 or 18 years old when uh, he was part of the group of the apostles of Jesus, and he is always represented very young, very juvenile. So, uh, and by the way, if you're wondering if that was very common, I think I have an image over here uh, to show you that in that period uh, of the history uh, uh, of the art uh, and the world, uh, male. Uh, young male, like boys that were very young, were usually represented very delicate. They look sometimes very feminine. Uh, maybe for us, that image looks very uh, feminine, but not really in that time, right? So it was very common to represent young men in this, in this way, very, very delicate, right? So finally, what is here on the table? Uh, we're going to finish with this part. This element you see here is a very delicious food Peruvians love very much. Are you ready to know what they are eating? Who knows this animal? Have you ever seen this animal before? In Spanish, we call kindly this animal cuy. <laughs> so like this, cuy, right? This is an onomatopoeic name oh, because this animal, oh, when he's a little bit afraid, he makes this sound. Quee, 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 quee. Oh, so quee, 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 quee. that's the way how we ended up giving this name to the animal, cuy, right? Guinea pig, exactly, exactly, my friends. Oh, so this Last Supper is very famous because Jesus Christ is eating <laughs> and to be very honest, I know this might be a little bit too much for you, but in Peru, we eat guinea pig because before the coming of the conquistadors, uh, we had not many options on, on, on let's say, um, protein, animal protein. So instead oh, of the chickens and beefs and porks, because we had none of those animals, they came with the Spaniards. Uh, we had alpaca, we had llama, uh, we, had guinea, we had guinea pig in the Andes. Uh, also, there was dog, wild dogs, uh, duck, no? quack, 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 uh, not dogs. <laughs> and, uh, well, in the coast, we had um, also more variety because we have fish, right? So, Jesus is eating guinea pig. <laughs> well, um, remember that the intention on adding these elements, these traditional like fruits, like the chili you're seeing here, or, or the or the red pepper, or the I don't know the, the uh, fruits that are local endemic, was to uh, assimilate or uh, uh, integrate the local culture of the indigenous uh, with the European one. Right. So the next section we are going to see uh, is also a, a very important. We have a series of uh, rooms, uh, very important two rooms that are coming. This is the last part of the uh, video. So we're going to go also to the next section. By the way, I will share the website also how it looks at the end of this uh, video. And now we're going to continue with two more rooms, the last two rooms of this uh, museum. So when we are coming to the end of the visit, uh, we always keep the best for the end <laughs> in the museums. Um, we have two special sections. So this is the entrance, uh, the entrance way. It looks like an altar, right? It's the entrance uh, into the sacristy. And right next to the sacristy, right next to the entrance to the sacristy, we have a painting uh, that is anonymous. The other one of the cuy, by the way, was painted by a, a Jesuit uh, monk, Diego de la Puente, in the year 1696. This painting you see over here is a little bit later. It's from 1734 and is anonymous. It's the family tree of the Franciscan order. 
family trees were very common scenes uh, in, in the orders, uh, in, in, inside uh, sometimes the churches or the monasteries. And in th those family trees you used to be able to see uh, the most important saints, sort of like the fruits of the order, the saints, uh, female, male. None of these saints that you saw in that painting were Peruvian. All of them were European, right? Um, and never came to Peru, by the way. Um, so this room, this next one you're seeing, is the sacristy, right? So the sacristy, for those that don't know what a sacristy is, the sacristy is the room, is the, is the place where the priest prepares for the mass. Uh, the priest uh, prepares, prays, uh, sort of like a, has a, a little, let's say, like a... Uh, sort of like a, a, tra there's a little tradition uh, before the Mass that is private. It's a spiritual preparation. There you see, for example, the drawers were closed like the one you're seeing here were uh, stored. And this material you're seeing here is silk. This is the way how the clothes of the priest used to be. Very fine, very refined. Silk and threads of gold threads of gold. So the nuns used to have the work of embroidering. That was the work of the nuns. The color of this, we call it casulla in Spanish, these this clothes that are used for the mass. Um, the color th that is light blue is related with the, um, the celebration of the Virgin Mary. For the Franciscans, uh, the patron of the order is the Immaculate Conception. Uh -huh. So uh, that's why uh, sometimes the clothing uh, can change of color. Uh -huh. Polly, I am so happy you don't mind. I said to little lambs. Oh, <laughs> yeah, guinea pigs, guinea pigs, my dear friends, are not for everybody, I know. <laughs> uh, but please, Polly, if you come here to Peru, I'll keep open-minded to, you know, trying very, very authentic local dishes. You don't need to have guinea pig, but maybe you can have ceviche, uh, for example. <laughs> and here also, this look at this ornament over here. Wow. Uh, we have gold and silver everywhere, uh, like diamonds and emeralds and amethysts. Mm? Uh, this is the... This is also a, a part of the of the typical decoration you'll see in churches in Latin America. This one, for example, was made uh, in Cusco. No? Um, the element you see over here is very traditional in some of the, uh, let's say, uh, decorations in churches. Um, for example, here we have the representation of the pelican. Uh, and the pelican, the tradition says that the pelican is capable to eat or open a womb in his own chest to give food to uh, uh, to his uh, babies. Uh, so um, this is sort of like a representation of what Jesus was able to do with his sacrifice for the world, right? So, um, and the next section we are going to see is the catacombs. So we're going now to go a little bit uh, farther, right? Uh, and I want to show you the catacombs of St. Francis. So as we go down deeper and deeper into the section that is called the catacumbas uh, of the convent of the Franciscans, we get to understand a couple of things. First of all, that the house, although, you know, you can see two floors, like first floor, second floor, it in reality has five because we know that there are two floors above the ground and three below, but only one of the below levels can be visited. This cemetery, uh, the catacombs of the Franciscan monastery, this cemetery was the first public cemetery of Lima, my friends the first public cemetery of Lima, eventually became a necessity for the citizens of Lima because remember that Lima was a walled city. We were walled. What if we were surrounded or sieged by enemies? 
Inca enemies or uh, pirates, right? Uh, so it was necessary to have a cemetery within the city uh, to uh, make, let's say, or create a space proper for the people who would die. If the siege was long, it was necessary a big space for burials. So um, originally, my friends, any church, any colonial church, not just in Lima, in the capital of Peru, in any city, a Spanish city created in the uh, Hispanic Americas, had a, a tomb section, a burial site. But the burials within the churches were exclusively for the monks of the order or the nuns of the, of the order and the benefactors of the order, right? So that was in the beginning. But later, as the population kept growing bigger and bigger, there was a necessity to make room for people from different social stratas, right? So that's how the catacombs of St. Francis were uh, created, the concept of the catacombs. For example, I made a little stop here in the video, because what you can see here is a tunnel, right? Can you see the tunnel, my friends? Uh, so we have a tunnel. If we were able to see what is above this tunnel, we would be standing on the very church of the Franciscans and we would be able to be right next to a line of altars. There are altars here. So all the people originally buried in these sections, in these mass graves, were devoted people to certain uh, saint, to certain, a certain group, Oh, they were devoted to Virgin Mary or, or the Immaculate Conception. They were devoted to St. Jude Tadeus, uh, to St. Martin of Porres, for example. So uh, if you were devoted to a specific saint, uh, one of the things you would like to be uh, able to be given is the opportunity to be buried below that saint, right? So uh, there was a really, really bad earthquake that Lima had, one of the many <laughs> we had in our history, in the year 1655. So um, it destroyed lots of Lima and destroyed also the church. Oh, so the church we see nowadays in Lima is from the year 1672. Right. So the central section of the church, it was open, uh, the underground section, and it was used this cement that you see here. I think we can get a little better perspective of the cement. You can see here that the foundation of the church is made from bricks and a material that you can also see on this side, on this section. This material is a combination of water sand, pebbles, and limestone, all mixed, produce a cement called, a cement-like material called cal y canto, right? Uh, we have inside the catacombs five very deep wells. They were not water wells. Now they look like this. Uh, they are sort of like ossuaries, right? And uh, the totality of people buried here in the catacombs is 25,000. 25,000 people were buried here in approximately 200 years uh, uh, of, of use of the cemeteries as a public cemetery. And in total, 300 years of use as, as a cemetery, as a regular cemetery, uh, uh, counting with the time when it was only used by the Franciscans and also their benefactors. So this is a little bit of how now this material looks, also the cement. Can you see the little pebbles here? So the pebbles from the river, the water, the sand, uh, eh, all mixed together uh, with clay, with, with limestone, creating this very strong cement that is the foundation of the house. But surprisingly, thank you, Grace. Thanks for your tip support. Muchas gracias. So surprisingly, this, the first floor and second floor of the house, what is above this level, are made on a, another material, uh, mud bricks mud bricks, right? So the idea was that the upper section would be flexible, but the foundation of the house, the catacombs would be resistant. So John is commenting, but the people are not buried as a whole. Oh, excellent commentary, John. Uh, let me explain this. 
So the burials, um, the system use was of mass graves. Uh, I think we're going to make a stop here again. So they are mass graves, right? So let me explain how the burial system work in the old days, because let's keep in mind that the city is just above the catacombs. So imagine all the smells of the bodies in putrefaction going upwards to the city, right? Through the ducts of ventilation that used to go to the church. It, it, it couldn't be possible. So instead of that, first of all, the bodies of the people, the devoted people who were buried here in the cemetery were brought here only by the Franciscans. The Franciscans were the only ones permitted to come inside, not the relatives. So these people uh, were, um, uh, let's say, the ones who took from uh, staircases that used to come from the church down into the catacombs, carrying the bodies without coffin. No coffin was used. The bodies were covered with a linen, a simple f and taken into the mass graves, right? So the bodies were piled one over the other, over the other, over the other, but the only the separation between these bodies was limestone. The lime was used to disintegrate. You can see also here the same, right? These are the uh, graves. So the bodies were deposited here and they were covered with limestone. So after the passing of the years, the passing of decades uh, and hundreds of years, the bodies completely disintegrated. They were completely dissolved by the, um, by the clay. Uh, so uh, eventually all the bones uh, deteriorated with the only exception, my friends, of femurs and skulls. That's why you see femurs and skulls. These femurs and skulls that you are seeing here, for example, once again, you can see in this section, right? Clearly femurs, right? And we have a skulls on another section. Uh, they were in the 1970s uh, arranged uh, as part of the museography of the museum. It is not that the body, that the leg bones uh, or the legs were separated and the heads were separated. This is something that was made in recent times, my friends. Also, uh, back in the old days, the Franciscans will never there to be in contact with dead bodies like rotting, you know, or even, you know, disrespecting, you know, the bodies, uh, like trying to arrange in them in certain ways. This is something new. This is more intended to be part of the museography, to give order. And also it was a way uh, to have an idea how many bodies people, uh, how many bodies of Franciscans buried in the catacombs. And now you know that the official number that the museum, uh, let's say, um, shares uh, is that there were 25,000 people buried in this complex, in this cemetery, right? So um, the museum, uh, it has also Besides, well, this, this circuit, uh, also a little gift shop, which I'm going to show you in a moment how, how it is. Uh, and also, uh, this museum is open from Monday to Sunday, every day of the week, from 9 a.m. until quarter past five, when they close the doors. Uh, that's the starting time of the last group, guided group inside. They offer guided service. They have a wonderful team of guides, local guides, in different languages, but mainly in Spanish and English. And uh, you can come also with your private tour guide. If you are going with a private guide, official licensed guide, you can have a private tour inside. So you can go to the catacombs, you can go to the library, you can go to the choir, any anywhere uh, that is part of the official circuit uh, will be allowed to you to see. Uh, also, let me just jump a little bit ahead uh, in the in this video to show you uh, the uh, the gift shop because uh, this is the only way how the museum besides the uh, the tickets uh, is is sustaining themselves. Um, they are very old fashioned, my friends. They, for example, don't allow pictures and videos inside. So imagine that's why they would never allow me to do a a, a regular like a hey go tour inside because they don't permit pictures and videos uh, to to visitors. But uh, they support themselves by selling postcards, by selling little souvenirs uh, that you can take home, like represent uh, recreations of the tiles 
of, of the house also, miniature ones. So this is the way how they make an extra. And I think, well, um, the museum, really the value, the historic value of the museum is is amazing. L let me also give you some information about the museum website, the official website of the museum. I think you cannot see it well here. Okay, so it's museocatacumbas.com, but um, this is a very modest museum. So they don't have a version in English, uh, but if you want to practice your Spanish, please come and join and check out the History Historia, for example. Uh, that would be super nice. They, they will tell you through this uh, section about the history of the museum in detail. Uh, also, well, the museum has, there are a lot of blogs dedicated to this uh, museum of the Franciscan order in the internet. Um, I, I really hope you were able to enjoy this event, my friend. This is pretty much an experiment I'm trying to do um, using, of course, this official, very nice footage, very nice documentaries that you can find in Peruvian television. Uh, once again, let me also tell you the name of the channel where you can get this documentary. The name of the documentary is Museo Sin Limites, Museums Unlimited, uh, Museo Convento San Francisco, and the channel is TV Peru. TV Peru. You have lots of nice documentaries there. Also, my friends, I will take the uh, little license of sharing with you my uh, information. If you would like to follow my upcoming tours, I was able to reach last week my first 1,000 followers. Woohoo! I'm so, so happy. Uh, so thank you so much for being part of this adventure of, of let's say, sharing culture. Um, I think the world uh, sometimes is, is, is covered with negativity or superficiality. Uh, and I want to be able to share with you uh, the beauty of my land, the beauty of my country. There are not so many good things in politics I can share <laughs> about Peru, but I think we can also talk a lot of about beautiful things of my country related with its history, its culture, its tradition. So my upcoming events are, by the way, the ones you're seeing here, Pachacama tomorrow. That's another museum that is an archaeological museum. If you want to come and see how this museum is uh, with this, all the documentary I have prepared for you, come please tomorrow. I hope you can make it. And also next week, we're going out again to visit some of the most famous parks of Lima. And we're going to Larcomar. So that's a really nice place also in the city. I just share my personal information if you wish to uh, get in contact with me. Uh, also, if you would like to support this channel, well, I am activating a button that will help you to um, to support. And, and, and as you know, these are uh, tip-based, uh, pay-as-you-wish events. So uh, your support is highly, highly, highly appreciated. So Thank you so much for, for being there. Repetitions of my events are on my channel because I don't repeat really um, on, on Hegel events. We have so much to talk about. So uh, I have a channel where you can get to see all the events that I will not be repeating. Uh, if you want to learn more about Lima, all the museums, etc. So please come over here. My channel is Adventurous Travel Guide. And well, finally, thank you so much to all people who were able to support. Muchas gracias. Grace again, Ben, amigo, gracias. Adrian, Marilyn, John, Polly. Muchas gracias, amigos. And let me turn on the camera, uh, the light, sorry, again to say bye to you all. Uh, so I hope you can come tomorrow. You are all invited. I have also been uh, my uh, lecture of tomorrow with these two wonderful books that are about Pachacamac. So I am super excited to share all the things I usually share with my groups here, but maybe more because we're going to have nice videos from, you know, from this documentary. And also very soon, I would like to take you for, for the birders. I don't know if I have birders uh, in the group uh, uh, to see some birds of Lima, unique endemic birds of Lima. Also, uh, maybe we can get to, to some natural spots to see some local birds. So, well, that's coming next. So if you can, please join, follow my channel. If, if, if you, if you want to learn more what I'm doing here. Uh, so, well, and all your comments, all your suggestions, recommendations are highly, highly appreciated. As always, I extended more the tour than I wanted. <laughs> but thanks so much for coming and staying with me until until the end, amigos.
All the best to you. Take care. Gracias, Polly. Thanks for your words. Gracias, Berha. Gracias, amigo. Lo máximo. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, Marilyn. A pleasure always. Uh, see you soon. Gracias. Take care. Have a lovely rest of the day, rest of the evening. Bye-bye.